Welcome back to the Disaster Tub Podcast. I'm your host, John Scardina. I am so excited for this episode to talk to you once again. Um, I was going to sing you a line from No Diggity. Great song. Let's talk about contractors. Let's talk about you and me. Okay. Um, I'm not a singer. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you today about a semi-serious topic that... I'm going to try as hard as I can to keep it positive in light because this is a positive show. It's educational. It's it's there to help you in the field and uh, really my counterparts um, globally at this point with the show. Big shout out to everybody who listens every week. Thank you so much. This week, I want to talk about burnout a little bit and how to recognize burnout and how to avoid burnout. And I'm going to use the story that I'm sure you've heard me before talk about it on the podcast if you've listened for the last couple of years. But the story is from Hurricane Harvey. And it's the first time where I felt like I had um, over uh, overextended my max. I really don't think most people know what their max is. I think people... Uh, believe they think they know what it is. That is, I certainly had an opinion of what I thought my max was. And then Hurricane Harvey hit. And um, the microcosm of overwork, lack of sleep, stress, trying to do good in the world, um, and dealing with personnel issues. We had to fire somebody, and headquarters was being stupid because they're honestly kind of stupid sometimes uh, they don't really get in the field and so it's like all these different things and at the same time you uh were working with you know i was working with local counterparts and i was really trying to help them out anyways it was just a really really stressful time and um you know one of the most catastrophic uh hurricanes in u.s history right so um I was not the only one who experienced that. There's a lot of people on my team who experienced it uh, because of, you know, the, you know, lots of factors, but basically it was overwork, lack of sleep. And um, the disaster required it. Um, if I could do anything different again, I wouldn't because of, I, I understood the mission and I understood my role um, as an emergency manager in that support. But nonetheless, uh, there was a moment where um, I was driving from the JFO, the Joint Field Office, to uh, the State EOC, Emergency Operations Center, and um, basically involuntarily screaming and punching my steering wheel and uh, crying, and I was probably going 110 miles an hour in heavy traffic on a highway. Really dangerous. And funny enough, all that tension of getting that out of my system, um, by the time I got to the JFO, it's totally fine. Or got to the EOC, it's totally fine. And walked in like nothing had ever happened, and I was good. Other people, um, one friend in particular, um, you know, hot Texas day, and, um, you know, found him in a car uh, crying, you know, just um, fetal position in the front seat, just so stressed out trying to get that energy out. And, um, you know... Uh, buddy of mine just kind of hugged it out for a bit and um, you know he got back to work and like nothing ever happened and um, you know it's it's kind of nice to be around a friend like that every once in a while who can understand it but again there was like story after story of story like that um, in Hurricane Harvey where we all had this stress and pressure and exhaustion and all that tension had to get out of our bodies and uh, you know, we were we were unwilling to take it out on other people, obviously. Uh, but at, nonetheless, um, there is a physical impact to that. Real quick, we're going to pause for this week's disaster tough endorsements. The L3 Harris Extreme 400P radio solves problems and is specifically designed for emergency services. How do we know? We field tested it with medical, urban search and rescue, and collapse and confined structures. 
This radio is amazingly tough. Check out the L3 Harris Extreme 400P radio at L3Harris.com right now. How do you spell Doberman Emergency Management? EOP, OEP, HVA, HMP, Thyra, TTX, Drone, PDA. Whenever you need an expert, Doberman Emergency Management field experts are there for support. Contact an expert at DobermanEMG.com today. The Readiness Lab is trailblazing disaster readiness. Early access for the highly anticipated course, Emergency Management Response for Dynamic Populations is currently live. Space is limited to 40. Go to thereadinesslab.com forward slash training to learn more. Okay, let's jump back in. There's also a different kind of impact, uh, you know, burnout, which is um, never ending uh, work and feeling like you're not moving the needle. And if you're listening to the podcast, if you've been one of those people on either spectrum where you were in a disaster for several weeks and you got burned out and you didn't know what to do once you got burned out that way, or the long-term burnout where a burnout comes from just like doing the same things over and over and over again, maybe during COVID, for example, um, and feeling like you're not really moving the needle or, um, you know, not having those moments of pure joy that come and that should come from this field. It's often a thankless field. Emergency management is a thankless field in so many ways. And it thankless from our stakeholders who hire us, thankful, thankless from emergency services counterparts. I mean, they have really no idea what we do. Um, and so from a very serious note, if you're experiencing that, and thank you for still listening to this podcast, which means you're still passionate about the field. But I also want to call that out and say, hey, like just like I had my buddy where I could, you know, talk to him and he could talk to me and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, and really as a team, we were able to do that and have that. And even like the nonverbal stuff, just like being around somebody who gets it, um, you know, that's that's huge. Sometimes a professional is amazing, right? Um so th there's those options there, and I would ex invite you to explore those options if you're feeling that. Um, sometimes it's taking a break from this kind of job and doing another kind of job. Um, you know, I have uh, another podcaster, Zach, who talks about, I think on a podcast, he talked about burnout and how he just like had to like switch jobs for a while because it's like, you know, still related to the field, but just needed a different, uh, you know, different pace. And what does that look like? And so... Um, We've all experienced those moments. And so my heart goes out to you if you are experiencing that. I want to talk to you about how to recognize that and also how to overcome it, um, maybe even from both perspectives. And um, some of this you might like, some of you might not like, but it, it works. And in, until it doesn't work, um, no, I'm just going to keep preaching the stuff. So first of all, how do you recognize it? One of the ways to recognize for me um, when I'm dealing with extreme exhaustion um, in both the work and just like my body is that I have a cognitive uh, delay in speech. Uh, my speech becomes more slurred. Um, maybe my vision becomes more blurry. Like there's like those kind of changes. But I constantly feel like, you know, funny enough, sometimes I really do feel like a, like a literal weight on my chest or I feel like this tension in my fist and I want to snap at people. If you're at the point where you, your first reaction is that you're going to snap at people or you're starting to snap at people, you can immediately recognize that, hey, I am in a place where I need to decompress immediately. And, um, you know, there you, you can do that from that way. Burnout can also come as you know the long-term burnout stuff can come off as disingenuous right like when you have you ever done this thing where you smile and as soon as the person turns away you stop smiling and it's a it's an intentional thing like you don't even realize you're doing it in the beginning but then like as soon as you don't have to be quote-unquote on anymore you turn off and um you kind of start going through the motions um you're not excited to come into work anymore. Uh, you know, you find yourself um, complaining often to your friends about the type of work you're doing or um, 
you're hypercritical of other people. Like one of the people, one of the, the symptoms I've seen is that they'll take it out, but in really weird ways. And, um, like w- one way is like, even though they're frustrated in their current job, they will start talking about how great they have it at their job and then start criticizing everybody else online. Have you seen that? Have you seen like, especially with boomers, let's be real, uh, go on and just like blast people constantly online. And then like, you're like, but you're not happy, right? Like, um, anytime somebody says they are happier than me or that my lifestyle is not the lifestyle they would ever want, but then they're constantly berating me over that. I'm like, why would I want to be like you? You're, you seem miserable. Um, so like, there's some signs of like that, of like, uh, not being genuine, going through the motions, not being excited about work, um, constantly. We're talking about like weeks, months, um, feeling tired all the time without any effort. Have you ever felt like really, really tired? Um, like felt like you're tired every day, but you haven't done anything to make yourself tired. There's, there's like not a, a lot of energy or you haven't really, uh, you're not producing your best work. All those are signs of burnout. Okay. Um, so with that, let's talk about how to overcome it. Now there's the, uh, tricking your brain stuff that we've talked about on the podcast. And that comes from nutrition and exercise. By making your body feel better, you will start to feel better. Your body will start to release those hormones, um, those endorphins, all that stuff. The chemical changes in your brain that says, hey, my body feels healthy, so I must be healthy. It's also a way just to get that energy out, right? Like, you know, doing some push-ups can really help out just to, like, get things out or just, you know, some kind of exercise, uh, walking, right? Um, just to decompress, get the the energy that's being built up out of your body. Um, so there, there's that. But I want to talk about it from uh, also professional help, right? Um, but I want to talk about it from how do you avoid it? That's kind of like the big thing I really want to talk about. How do you avoid burnout um, from a career perspective? How do you overcome or uh, better yet prevent burnout from happening? Now, if you're in a disaster, sometimes it is forcing yourself to sleep. Sometimes it is forcing yourself to stop for, you know, one hour so that you're more productive for eight. And there's a, there's a it's a tough realization for other people, or really 12, right, or 14 hours. But, like, if you just stop for one hour, you actually might be so much more productive for the next 14. And so don't just keep grinding it out when you're beyond tired. So there's that. So, um, frequent breaks are good. I'm a big fan of frequent breaks. There's the other one that's going to be, uh, obvious to some, uh, somehow like blind as a bat to others. Emergency managers crave, yes, crave innovation. However, there is almost no incentive for these beltway bandit giant contractors to innovate because the governments who are giving them contractors are incentivizing them not to innovate, which doesn't make any sense. If you look at even government, you look at the DOD, it is run by innovation. If you presented to the DOD right now that you think we should use horses and wagons to go to war with Russia or China, you'll get a lot of blank stares and confusion. It's all about the war fighter. It's all about the next gen uh, technology. It's all about becoming more efficient and more capable and the newest technology. But as soon as you tell somebody in emergency management, especially those who, let's be real, don't know how to use technology, they'll say, well, the EMP happens. We got to revert back to paper. Do you think the Department of Defense is not aware of the impacts of CBRN, especially radiological impacts, nuclear impacts. Like if you look at that for real and say like, oh, I shouldn't use technology. You're right. Let's not use drones, right? Oh, you're right. Let's not use, you know, night vision goggles that cost, you know, hundred thousand dollars each, right? Let's not use these uh, satellites, right? That's ridiculous. 
the argument that you shouldn't use technology or that you shouldn't push for new technologies in our field for life-saving, life-sustaining, because we might have to revert back to paper is absolutely insane and quite frankly doesn't make any sense to me at all anymore like when i was younger in the field like yeah you're right like if something happens we got to do that but you're telling me right now literally right now we could be infinitely more successful in identifying who needs help helping them and getting them back on their feet especially with mitigation and we're not innovating here's another one is uh policy policy and building codes it's not very sexy i get that it's not the drone for example but you know it's the best you know preparedness and again that word's blacklisted with me the best preparedness thing that we've ever done in this country is firefighters telling people to um to change building codes putting sprinklers on roofs for example in arizona for wildfires putting uh, smoke alarms in homes and um, carbon monoxide detectors, uh, telling people don't smoke in bed, right? The best people who have figured out how to do emergency preparedness are not emergency managers. They're firefighters. They're absolutely the best. They're the, the king, the queen, the head honcho, the top dog, whatever. If you want a lesson learned about um, preventing disaster in people's lives, go to firefighters and look what they've done education in schools, changing building codes, changing policy, using their persona as heroes in the in, in the field to get other people to do what they want to do, taking command and control of that situation. They have saved lives before disaster even started because of the work they've done. Let's just call it for what it is. Firefighters are the best emergency preparedness people that we have um, by date. And honestly, uh, that's fantastic for firefighters and fantastic for, uh, you know, a global perspective. However, emergency managers really should be leading that way in mitigation and policy and development and in technologies and in innovation. Like, we really should be the experts in that. Why aren't we? Right? Uh, we understand the impacts of fire. We understand impact the, We understand the impacts of law enforcement issues like active shooters, active assailants bomb threats, CBR incidents, hazmat, technological issues, right? Like cyber and all the things. And we were supposed to be able to bring all the hazard. We said it's an all hazards plan. And yet when I ask people about their all hazard plan, what are they doing with their all hazards plan? The person is going onto word and typing it out, right? Come on guys. Like we have better tools than that. Now there are things that if we asked other industries to help us out, Google, uh, Facebook, not Facebook, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Apple, whatever, these tech companies, these tech giants to help us innovate our field. Do you know how fast they could do that? I mean, truly innovate overnight. Here's an example. Google has shapes, billions and billions of shapes for every kind of thing you can possibly imagine. They understand, they know what a shape of a shingle looks like from a point cloud perspective. They understand what a a door handle looks like, what a road looks like, the siding looks like, all that stuff. Imagine us in real time with a drone flying over a row of houses after a hurricane and it's detecting what materials are there and what materials are not there and how it's broken and all that stuff, all through Shape Cloud and in real time telling us the economic damage of a disaster. You're saying that if we use drones to do that, and point cloud data and, you know, even artificial intelligence, all that stuff to get an estimate to be able to send to FEMA from the state that we could do that in real time. And yet we are still sending out PDA teams. Why? Why are we doing that? It's because people are trying to protect a job more than protect the field, right? And so I'm really passionate about this. Uh, we've been leaning really hard into innovation at Doberman. Uh, when we work or choose to work with a client, they know that we're going to try to provide innovative solutions for them. University of California, Irvine is a perfect example of an amazing team. They have a four member team at UCI who's doing incredible work and they supplement that work through hiring us to come up with innovative solutions. We created a custom app for them. We did a physical security assessment. We went through every building, every room in like two days 
and we were able to officially tell them where they were at as a university, the good and bad and the ugly, and none of it was subjective, right? It was actually based on data. Really hard to come back from a stakeholder who doesn't want to do anything and say, hey, here's the national best practice. Here's like the hard numbers, percentages of, you know, locations with cameras or whatever. And it's like, oh, this becomes obvious. And that leads to my second point outside of innovation is we need to start giving ourselves a leg up. Pete Gaynor was uh, just did an article uh, really talking about this. And I agree with him 100 percent. Emergency management professionals don't really do a great job of presenting who we are and what we do. One is because of lack of standards. Now, I've addressed that in the past, right? Emergency services is the protection of life, property, and continuity of operations. Emergency management is strategic coordination of emergency services, period, right? Very simple definitions that you can expound and, and build off of. And those who don't want to define it are the ones who push it back. Like this kind of stuff that we're talking about is um, about innovation and presenting yourself through branding, through um, better communication. We were talking about communications and AARs. Let's talk about communicating with stakeholders. When you say things like all hazards plan, they're hearing from you that you're a doomsday prepper and you think every hazard's going to happen. Now I've talked about that before on the podcast, haven't I? Like, even though we understand frequency and consequence and all this other stuff, are we articulating that to other people? The third piece about that is now coming into full circle here is the pitch for real, there's an asterisk here, real contractor support. Now, there are companies out there, as one start, starts with an H, one starts with an I, another one starts with a D, uh, another one starts with an M, that are notorious for pushing out cookie cutter work that is just trash, right? Like I've seen a, a very large contract that one of them got. And like, let's be real, like when I went through it with my team, they, they forgot to change some of the names out. They literally just did like a find and replace for most they, they could. And like for a misspelling, they still left in like the previous client's name in there. Like that's bad. Like that's that they didn't use any stakeholder involvement. They didn't use GIS data for knowing their hazards. It was just copy and paste definitions. Right. And so, um, th there's those organizations out there, stop hiring them. Right. It is bewildering to a lot of us. It was bewildering to me when I was in the public sector. It's bewildering to me now as a small business, how these companies get these contracts when I will talk to their account the, the people in the, the hiring them are like, oh yeah, I know it like kind of sucks, but we need the support. If you know it sucks, then don't hire them, right? Like force their hand to be more innovative, force their hand to help you out with presentation and be a real support. But there's other organizations that pride themselves on innovation, stakeholder involvement, being the tip of the spear. Em emergency management deserves that support, you know? When people push back against contractors in general, or even the concept of that, I will look at their program and they're a team of one for like a large university or a team of two or their, um, their duties as assigned for a city. You know, either they don't get what emergency management is or they're, they're following into that burnout stage of they, that pride level goes so high that like, I like almost like the, the hero complex, like I can do this all by myself. I don't need support a company like mine. We don't provide long-term support. Somebody hires us because they have a problem and we go in there and we overcome that problem or we provide that foundation and step out. And, um, it's r incredibly rewarding. And honestly, like uh, the pitch for contractors, me specifically, or my team is this in the last year, I've worked with universities, K through 12, um, county governments, um, the DOD, NATO, um, police departments, fire departments, um, uh, professional stadiums and, um, corporations. I've worked with all those different entities to help them out with their emergency plans and training 
And that was over the course of a year. I have had so many more fun experiences not being pigeonholed by being able to work with everybody. It's actually a blast. Like when if I get to go to a professional stadium like I did last week, and we're talking about you know EOPs and active shooter and long range shooter stuff, and then I get to go literally in the same day to an airport and talk to them about crowd control and uh, evacuations and messaging and how to get vendors on board and all this other stuff. Like that's way fun, you know? And so it, it not only is a blast to be able to do that at the same time, when I was in the government, I would, I had one specific thing that I had to focus on and talk about burnout, right? Now I get to jump to all these different projects and help out these different clients and becoming more and more well-rounded, especially as the team grows and working with people with amazing perspective. So um, that's the third thing I would say is don't be afraid to use grants and to um, spend a little bit of your budget on, yes, that an expensive contractor. Identify somebody or group out there that can actually do the job, who actually has credentials, uh, like real credentials, like degrees, um, and a work history and all that stuff. Like do your due diligence, of course. Um, but don't be so afraid of contractors. Like I meet people who, um, you know, hear about a little bit about my work history and they're like, oh my gosh, like, uh, we get along really, really well. And we'll, we'll chat. It'll be like at a conference or something. Or like when I moved to St. Louis, it happened a lot. And when they found out I went from the public sector to the private sector, it's like, you can see the physiological change. Like they die inside a little bit. They're like, oh no. If I'm nice to you, that means it's nepotism. They don't really know what nepotism means, but that's what they think it is. And then they think, like, I'm just there for the money. And it's like, uh, you know, just as much as I've met some pretty terrible contractors out there, I've also been on the public side and that real world worked with a lot of people who, or some people, who were there for 9 to 5 and they left at 3 p.m., right? Like, it was really 9 to 3 and they were there for their retirement check and it was an easy job and it's really hard to get fired in the government. And especially at, you know, the headquarters level, like, oh my gosh, like those people are exist. Those people are, are real. And I'm sorry if you have to work with those people. It does make our job harder when we already have a messaging problem and they're not putting their best foot forward. They also might be burned out, right? Um, have you ever met somebody who just seemed like the worst in one situation then you saw them in another situation they were lively and exciting and they were laughing with other people and you're just like you just don't get it it's because they're burned out in the other situation right and so um that's what i i would uh, call that out a little bit so just in recap here the three things that can help you avoid burnout both in the disaster perspective and the long-term burnout perspective is innovation innovation with technologies being on the forefront of technologies and making sure you're working with people who are encouraging innovation to be more efficient, but also on the policy and on the building code perspective. If we are supposed to be the experts in emergency management and emergencies, all hazards, quote unquote, then we should be at the forefront of helping politicians and private sector stakeholders get better at mitigation. Mitigation should be, you know, above all, honestly. And so there's that. The second thing you can do supporting yourself is update your messaging. Now, messaging includes branding. There's a whole episode with that with CJ and Landon from Noble Creative and talking about how we came up with the Readiness Lab logo. Now, I want other people to use our icon. Some people might push that in the back, but everybody has their own style, right? But whatever it is, um, we as an industry, not just in your department or in your agency, but we as an industry need to be much, much better at messaging. Honestly, that might mean taking a marketing class. That might be learning about sales a little bit, learning how to interact with people, uh, defining our scope of work. I've provided two definitions for you today, for example. And the last thing that you want to do is add the support where you need it. Don't be afraid to ask for help, for help. That might be going to your supervisor and hiring another person to support you in your job. That might mean hiring a contractor to support you to get over these humps that you need to get over. 
Um, avoid the pretenders. Don't allow pretenders anymore for EM contracting or for any other, you know, social issue, religious, whatever. Like, never allow the pretenders who are not meeting expectations to represent practitioners. Um, it is incredibly frustrating as a practitioner to have to deal with the pretenders, but just weed them out. Don't work with them. Um, you know, again, just calling out FEMA, they hire these really big companies and then the people at FEMA complain about the work that they provide, or even worse, those companies are like, hey, I'm not incentivized to, to, to actually fix any of these problems. I'm here to do X as outlined in the contract. So let's get better that as a field, right? Innovate, communicate, support. Those three, those three things. And, um, you know, I'm just going to call it there for there. Again, if you're experiencing burnout in one way or the other, I'm sorry you're going through that. I've been there. It is exhausting. Um, every day is hard during those moments. Um, at the same time, you will overcome this. If you do those three things, you'll overcome it even faster in the future. But if you're doing with it right now, reach out to a friend, talk to somebody else who gets it. Maybe uh, talk to um, somebody who's a professional helping reduce that stress, eat well, you know, exercise, all the things. Do uh, everything you can um, that is in your power to, to overcome that. And, um, I get, again, I understand this is a little more of a serious episode, but, um, I thought it was important to address. Um, if you got something out of this podcast episode, if you want to avoid burnout and you're trying to be innovative, share those innovative ideas that you've come up with. If you like our, uh, our idea on messaging, um, love to know if you're starting to implement some of those uh, tips and tricks that we've been sharing. And uh, most important, if, um, if you need somebody to talk to, uh, please reach out. Um, you know, you can do it at contact at the readiness lab.com, or you can reach out to our company. That'll get to me info at Doberman EMG.com. Either way, hopefully you got something out of it. Hopefully this helped you out, innovate, communicate, get support, and, uh, you'll, uh, you'll get for the win. All right. Peace. We'll see you for the next one. Like and subscribe five stars. The whole deal.